Our second last talk of the day is going to be super, super interesting. We're going to talk about how fully homomorphic encryption is actually becoming more and more practical. We're going to talk about how you can actually think about what that is and get a better intuition, and how INCO, in this case, is specifically applying that to the EVM with custom opcodes to do FHE. So please welcome Remy on stage to talk about FHE on the EVM. Give him a big round of applause. Hi everyone, so I'm Remy, the founder of Inco. What we're building is what we call the Universal Confidential Computing Network. So today all the L1, L2s have one thing in common, is that there are transparent databases. So what does it really mean? We actually believe that there needs to be a minimum of confidentiality necessary for mass adoption. So I'll give you a couple of examples. If we were to actually onboard billions of people to blockchain systems today, it would actually be social chaos because everyone's bank accounts will be completely revealed, and you wouldn't be able to do payroll in a confidential manner. Institutions and enterprises are still having a hard time entering this space. They have trade secrets, they have compliance reasons, uh, and private blockchains are not quite the same because they don't have the same level of user base, and so overall, you know, the lack of confidentiality is still very problematic. And lastly, there are just a lot of use cases that wouldn't make sense without confidential computes, so think of like maybe the, the, the card games, like poker, for example, uh, private voting, or blind auction. So what we're building is we, what we believe to be the missing layer of the blockchain stack, the confidential compute layer. So this is very similar to you know, back in the early internet, when nothing was encrypted, you could only do academic research. It was really until SSL came to be to, you know, now you can start encrypting credit cards, uh, payments. You know, so this is where we see, you know, confidentiality being a missing layer, a missing stack, that's quite crucial for practical adoption. So who has heard of FHE here, by show of hands? Okay, great. So for folks who have never heard of this, it's a very different cryptography than ZK. Uh, so what it does is one thing only, and very well, which is encryption, but also compute on top of encrypted data. So what does this mean? So for folks who are not uh, technical, Imagine having the ability to encrypt a picture, like this QCAP picture. You can still modify the pixels using math. You can add, divide, multiply. And by the time you decrypt, now you have a filter, right? It almost sounds like magic. But so this is what really what FHE enables, is computation on top of, of some kind of encrypted data without seeing what it is. And so FHE is not new. It's been around, you know, this concept has been around for 40 years now. It first came in the 70s. Uh, with privacy, pri privacy homomorphism. Back then, it was just pure fantasy. It was more of a, an idea, what if we could you know, enable something like this? It was really 20 years later, the first proof that this was somewhat possible uh, with the Pali crypto system, where you could do you know, some additions. And you know, the challenge with FHE is that you know, when you encrypt data, you have this thing called ciphertext. So essentially, you have some data, some data padding, some noise, and some noise padding. As you compute on, that, on top of these ciphertexts, there is this noise accumula accumulation that basically builds up until this ciphertext is no longer valid. So in 2009, there was another breakthrough basically uh, came out with, with um, Credit Gentry uh, with this concept of bootstrapping. So what bootstrapping enables really is the process of denoising. And so you can basically keep the noise in check and keep on performing operations. But that process was still very slow until 2021 with this concept of programmable bootstrapping, which makes this bootstrapping process a lot faster and efficient. And the way you scale FHE is actually using hardware acceleration. So you know, uh, FHE is actually compute down. There's no networking time. You don't have to communicate across different nodes. So the way to scale FHE is using specialized hardware that are specialized to you know, support like, uh, operations that are, that are more specific to FHE here. And a lot of these hardware are actually coming out next year, so you know, the path to scaling is pretty straightforward and also happening pretty soon. So why you know, FHE is interesting in terms of a confidentiality solution? So there has been you know, a lot of legacy solutions uh, using ZK. Uh, so here, you know, we can call them commitment-based uh, approaches. 
uh, versus you know FHE, which is encryption-based approaches. So there are a couple of differences here. So first, first of all, the way you approach commit-based solution is the user would basically generate a zk proof on the on the client side. So you know it's actually the compute overhead is actually offloaded off chain. Uh, with encryption-based systems, typically you need the blockchain to basically do all the stage transitions uh, for every single user. So there's a difference here in terms of scaling. In terms of privacy, uh, commitment-based solution you can argue is more private because each user has their own encryption key and their secret actually never leaves the client. Right? They, every time they generate a ZK proof, they also attach it to a viewing key for, let's say, the recipients. And so in a way, it is more private. Encryption-based system, essentially, you end up sharing some kind of decryption key. So you know, it could be a single private key that a system uh, utilizes, or it could be MPC-based. right? So, but the idea here is that you have to delegate decryption to a third-party authority, so you can argue it's less private because there is this risk of collusion. But there are benefits to this. right? So when you delegate the decryption key to a third party, you're actually making decryption rules a lot more flexible. So what do I mean by this? In a commitment-based system, essentially every time you have to delegate this viewing key, uh, you have to specify viewing key to a recipient, right? But what if this recipient loses uh, his or her key? Uh, or what if you want to delegate this viewing key to, let's say, your accountant, right? So it, this system is, becomes a lot more rigid when it's commitment-based. Uh, versus an encryption-based system, you can actually program the decryption logic, uh, let's say, on-chain, and so it becomes very easy for you to you know, uh, specify who can view this uh, encrypted cipher text. The fourth point is really around this idea of composability. So when you have a commitment-based system, you have this you know, prover and verifiers set up where you know, all, all the circuits, the logic happens off-chain, the private data happens off-chain, it becomes very difficult to compose across multiple applications uh, because these states, by default, don't talk to each other. You need a centralized prover to coordinate these states, so it's a lot more rigid. Uh, but within encryption, like we said earlier, FHE allows for confidential compute on top of these private states, so it's actually a lot more straightforward. So you can have this idea of shared private state, and everyone can interact with this. And then lastly, key rotation. Uh, so I mentioned earlier, revoking a key uh, in a commitment-based system is actually very difficult, right? Uh, it's basically not possible. You specify them ahead of time. And so it's problematic if you lose your key. Uh, but encryption-based system, you could actually rotate the key. So you can do this over re-encryption or transferring directly using FHE here. So what does this mean when you apply FHE to the EVM? What you're really doing is you're augmenting the EVM with new types and new operations. So a couple of exam examples here. So you have uh, encrypted integers, EUINT. You also have encrypted booleans, encrypted addresses, encrypted bytes, and then you can compute on top of them. So you can add, let's say, two integers, hidden integers together using tfhe.add. You can multiply them. Uh, you also have uh, on-chain randomness that can be derived from FHE here. So the idea is re-augmenting the existing EVM with additional types uh, that wouldn't exist otherwise. And so there are many existing FHE schemes around. Uh, the reason why we chose the TFHE scheme, which stands for FHE or the Taurus, uh, is because it has a couple of properties here that are quite useful. Uh, so for one, it supports a pretty wide array of operations, uh, from divisions to multiplications to additions. It also supports exact computation. So what do I mean by this? Um, there are other schemes that are limited by, you know, first of all, specific operations such as additions and multiplications. If you want to support more complex operations, they become approximations. So you can imagine in a scenario of a smart contract, what if your balance is never accurate, right? So that, that wouldn't quite make sense. So you want this property of exact computation over ciphertext. And lastly, it's non-level. So some schemes are bound, has to be, you know, are bound by levels. So what I mean is you have to know ahead of time how many steps, how many computes you have to do, and then there's a big bootstrap. The challenge with smart contracts is you, know, you want a system that can you know, compute any arbitrary logic, and so you don't necessarily know ahead of time, how many steps there, there's going to be, right? So this is where a non-level structure is actually uh, very, very, um, makes a lot more sense for the smart contract um, use case here. And so here from a high level, you know, what we're building is this confidential compute layer for existing blockchains, uh, such as Ethereum, uh, the, the major L2s. And I know I just mentioned FHE this entire time, but really this is a coordination across FHE, ZK, and MPC. So I'll just quickly go over you know, how these uh, systems interact with each other. So on the far left, let's talk about decryption. So decryption is done by a MPC network. So what this really means is that 
the private key that everyone encrypts uh, to for composability is never held by a single party. So in order to decrypt something, you need a threshold of these parties to do partial decryptions and then combine enough of a threshold to recreate the plain text. So this actually guarantees that you know, no single party can start decrypting everyone's balances. You need some kind of threshold. For compute, we're using you know, FHE. Uh, so here you have compute nodes who, you know, based on the set of instructions, whether it's addition, multiplication, divisions, will perform these computations. And FHE has this property that's deterministic. So if I add two ciphertexts together, the result will always be the same. So this is where, you know, when you use something like consensus-based blockchain, you can actually verify the work, that the work has been done correctly. So if you think about, you know, this property is actually very interesting for the case of blockchains. Because block transparent blockchains, the reason why they're transparent is because you need the ability to verify that every single transaction has happened correctly, right? But now with FHE, because everything is deterministic, you actually get the same property. And because it's all cryptography based, it's actually very aligned with the you know, original cypherpunk idea also of using cryptography to solve for privacy. So overall, you know, applying FHE to blockchain uh, is actually quite suitable in terms of form factor. And then lastly, the ZK piece. So every time you encrypt something on the client side, you want the user to prove that the ciphertext is now malformed. Because as you can imagine, if the ciphertext is malformed, there's going to be computation issues right later on. And the second is the user needs to prove that they know what the plain text is. The reason why is, you know, what if someone copy-pasted your ciphertext you know, by looking on chain and then deployed it somewhere else, right? Uh, to decrypt it, then there's, there's going to be information leakage. So this is where ZK is applied. It's really just a proof of knowledge and also proof that you know, the ciphertext is not malformed. So when we launch mainnet, we'll enable folks to directly write FHE code on top of Ethereum and also existing L1, L2s. And with that, what you really get is the ability to you know, tap into the existing user base and TVL. So you don't have to move to a new, new chain. You can just, let's say, deploy a poker game on Arbitrum or build, let's say, a payroll system on, on Ethereum. So how does this work, right? How do we get Ethereum, for example, to run FHE? So from a high level, you know, so on the right side, what you see is an example of a ciphertext. So this is the encrypted data. And on the left side is a handle. So you can think of a handle almost like a, the key to the value. So it's like a key value pair relationship. And you can think of the handle as, like, for example, the hash of the ciphertext. So what you're storing on Ethereum is really just the handle or the representation of the ciphertext. So when you do something like an FHE add on Ethereum, what you're adding within the parameters, so here it's uh, Alice balance, also the hidden amount. These are two handles, right? These are two ciphertexts. What you're really doing is a symbolic execution, meaning that you're actually not running FHE on Ethereum. What you're doing is you're creating the third handle. And the third handle is just a hash of the two previous handles. So what this really means is everything that happens on Ethereum is actually just a mocked operation, or it's a symbolic execution. And this will later on happen on Ingo. Essentially, we will do the actual computation. So Ingo will be abstracted away from the end user perspective, and you will be able to write FHE logic directly on top of existing EVMs. And so let's talk about use cases. You know, why is this interesting? It's interesting because if you think of this concept of private state, it actually exists everywhere. It's literally how we build things in Web2. If you want to build something like eBay in Web2, you need to be able to shield everyone's bids, right? And this concept of private states just doesn't make sense in current blockchains because everything is transparent. Everyone, everyone has perfect information. And so this is where you know, we can grow the pie of what's possible across different verticals, you know, gaming, DeFi, asset management, infra. Gaming is probably one of the most interesting one because if you think about all the fun games that exist in Web2, they all have some kind of hidden mechanics, right? Whether it's hiding your stats, uh, your resources, uh, your, your cards, right? Um, and these are, are all the missing basic primitives that makes a game fun that, that they don't, just don't, simply don't exist in, in, uh, in Web3 today. In terms of you know, simple payment systems such as payroll, uh, cap tables, real assets, everything is transparent today. So there needs to be something a bit more practical, some minimum confidentiality, else, like I said earlier, onboarding billions of people today in Web3 is actually would be social chaos. It wouldn't make sense for my neighbor to know how much money I have, right? It can actually put myself at risk. It doesn't make sense for everyone to see what I voted, right? Let's say 
uh, presidential election, right? I know families who don't talk to each other because they have different views on politics. So there are a lot of practical reasons why confidential computing is necessary. And you know, privacy really is the spectrum. You have confidentiality and anonymity, right? But what people, a lot of people don't realize in crypto is you know, it's not about necessarily hiding your trace. It's, there's just so, many, so much more that you could do. So let's go over a couple use cases here. So in the most basic case, it's just a confidential ERC-20. Uh, for folks who you know, understand solidity, the way this is implemented is just the mapping of address to an event, so encrypted integer. When you do a ERC-20 transfer, you're adding a hidden amount to you know, someone's hidden balance. Pretty straightforward. For something like a card game, you know, we are able to generate hidden cards using FHE here. And uh, as you know, poker is a bluffing game. It wouldn't make, make sense if all the cards are public. And so this is quite convenient because you know, VRF has existed for quite some time in crypto, but they are transparent uh, by default. And so a hidden VRF, I would say, is uh, probably a, one, one of the newer primitive uh, that are quite useful here for, for games. Uh, we actually built this a year ago uh, during East Global. And uh, so who has played the game Mafia before? Or Werewolf, I show hands. Yeah, so this is a bluffing game. So you, know, you generate different roles. You could be a secret killer, doctor, or detective. This game would not make sense if all the information is public, right? And more importantly, I mentioned this concept of private state or shared private state earlier and composability. The reason why this game is so easy to build and was actually built over 24 hours is because the blockchain itself is the shared private state layer. So the players can directly interact with the smart contract in a permissionless manner. Any state transitions, coordinations, all happens at the smart contract layer. You don't need a you know, off-chain prover or any other off-chain systems to basically coordinate. Some other benefits, you know, if you think about something like a private AMM, uh, where you get to trade tokens, there is this natural MEV protection as well because your intents are sort of masked, right? If the, the bots don't know how much you're trying to, to swap and the pools are encrypted, there's no way for them to you know, front run you and then send, send, send attack you, right? And then another example is private voting. So, you know, the idea here is that you can directly cast your votes. Uh, the way you would do this in practice is you can encrypt your, uh, your choice. And then using essentially, um, I can go over this real quick uh, because we have a little bit more time here. Uh, essentially, when you write confidential compute code, you cannot use if else statements because if else statements actually leaks information about the underlying encrypted data, right? So there's a clever way to do this over FHE here called CMUX or select. It's essentially a ternary. So in the first line of code for folks who can see it here, so um, if the encrypted choice is equal to one, you know, you will return an encrypted Boolean that will actually be true, but it's actually encrypted, right? What you do is you pass in this encrypted Boolean into this ternary function called CMUX that returns the actual vote count if it's true and then zero if it's false. But it's a, both are actually encrypted, so you cannot tell if it's true or false, right? You, de, you do the exact opposite for against, which returns zero if it's true and then the vote count if it's false. So now, you know, one of them is going to be the actual vote count and you add both of these to their respective tallies. So you, you can see how, you know, building confidential computes, uh, smart contracts actually does require a little bit different design thinking, but it's actually very feasible to you know, run con conditionals without leaking the underlying information. So we are compatible with existing Ethereum tool tooling, so uh, this is where you can, get, you can get started very quickly. Uh, if you know Solidity, you know how to use Hard Hat um, MetaMask Remix, then it should take you less than 20 minutes to get started. And in terms of FHE, we are able to support quite a big range of operations today and comparisons. So it's really up to you to you know, think through what novel use cases can be built um, using these tools, right? If you want to build an AMM, there, there, there is the vision. If you want to build a, a simple governance platform, there are additions and comparisons. So it's really up to you to you know, um, just figure out you know, what else, what's new, and then you know, we're always happy to provide you feedback uh, if you have some interesting ideas. So you can find our documentation here. Uh, we have some demos with this arcade page. And uh, yeah, definitely join our Discord and Telegram. Our team members are always online to you know, answer questions and answer, also help you provide feedback on your ideas. Thank you.